Hello, I'm one of those scary internet hacking people. And with that in mind, please make sure to use the free open Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Log into Facebook, Twitter, do some online banking. It's really, I've checked it out, it's, it's super secure. <laughs> so I'm here, hopefully, to shed some light on the hacking world and to perhaps change perceptions of it a bit and show that hackers can be a force for good in the future. Because so everything's connected to the internet, everything's connected together from that screen there. And there's like, a, there's like a robot thing down there you'll see in the break that's got Bluetooth in it to everyone's phones and here's to the Wi-Fi. To, you know, to every time we walk around the O2, we're, we're being tracked. They can probably get our home addresses just by following our mobile signals. So a little bit about how I got into the hacking world. I grew up in the Shetland Islands, which are here. As you can tell, there's nothing to do in the Shetland Islands. <laughs> I won a knitting contest in school. We had three knitting classes a week. And I thought that was, that was quite fun, a simple life of knitting and herding sheep and, and farming peat. But instead, I joined a politically motivated global hacking collective instead, which is kind of the only other option in the Shetlands. <laughs> so I, I went under the alias Topiary. I used a kind of ludicrous ASCII horse as an avatar. And you can see below, we'd started to use this headless suit with, with the question mark, the sort of symbol of uh, we are legion, we do not forgive, we do not forget, we are, we are everyone and no one, all of that, all of that kind of pretentious nonsense. We, we started some of that. And we started putting that stuff up on government websites during the Arab Spring in 2011, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Zimbabwe. In support of protesters, we would deface government web pages. We wouldn't release any information or anything like that or try and harm individuals. We would just put messages of support up that say, we know your government's trying to suppress information to the outside world. We know that they don't want you to think you have support, but know that the internet, the, the hive mind, the anonymous mask, we're all here for you. So we wrote a bunch of nonsense up there. The thing that I'm, I suppose, most known for, which was also one of the biggest mistakes I made, was um, hacking into this terrible cult called the Westboro Baptist Church, um, racist, homophobic um, cult that pickets the f uh, funerals of dead soldiers in the States. And we decided, well, they, they declared war with Anonymous. It's a very amusing statement. Um, and they, they kind of thought to get media attention off of it and stuff on the back of the, the Arab Spring. And so we went uh, onto a live radio show with them and hack their website live, which I thought would be a very amusing way to do it, and just a way to get across. We, we don't really care about you. We've got, we've got more revolutionary stuff to get on with, but we'll just do it anyway. That went viral online, and I made this massive mistake of just sort of being quite carefree at the time and not very, being a very good hacker, and just didn't use any voice modification software. So just for how you're hearing me now is how I sounded on that radio show, which is a really, really bad idea. And I'm most known for just doing stuff like that and tweeting just pretentious nonsense like you cannot arrest an idea, which is something I tweeted right before I was arrested <laughs> the following day. We started, myself and six others started this group called Lulsec. It's a bit more difficult to explain. We used a giant flying cat in space as a logo and a giant boat made out of ASCII art and a little stick man with a, with a glass of wine in an effort to sort of say, Yes, we've done this hacking under the anonymous banner, under the big scary mask, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And everyone kind of sees those hacks and go, "Yeah, that's it. that's that's impressive. Security's a thing, but that's anonymous. Of course, they can do it. They've got these big bunkers everywhere. There are these super, you know, super super horde of of people around the world. What if we, a bunch of idiots with a stupid cat and a stick man, could do the same thing? People started looking at it and going, "Hang on, we need to think about security now." Uh, so we would do things like. Uh, news websites, the P PBS disagreed with uh, a WikiLeaks documentary that was made, so we just thought, okay, we've got access to the PBS website, let's not do anything, we'll just publish a fake story from them saying Tupac and Biggie Smalls are alive in New Zealand. <laughs> Some people to this day think that that's real still. Um, and during the phone hacking scandal, not a big fan of the Sun newspaper, News of the World, published an article from the Sun staff writer saying that Rupert Murdoch had died in his garden um, instead of going to to um, give evidence of the phone hacking scandal, the Leveson inquiry. Things got a little bit out of hand in that we started targeting uh, government websites, the CIA website that went down for a while, the Department of Defense, the Senate, etc. And the thing at, at the time was, I think this is true of a lot of hackers, you don't really see the difference between these sites or these targets. They look exactly the same. They're all through this kind of square that's just screened into this other world. Taking down the CIA's website, 
to some teenage hacker feels the kind of same as playing a game online or looking at a video on YouTube. It all kind of blends psychologically into the same space. And I've come to terms now of sort of what the ramifications of it all were, but at the time it just felt, it felt like a game, which is a very, very bizarre, and I, think, and I think a lot of hackers suffer from that, where only after, only after it's all put in kind of a nutshell, or like an image like this, that they realize, oh, hang on, no, that is the, that is the CIA. <laughs> Things got a bit, we only, it sort of hit home when the cat, the, the stupid cat and the stick man figure we all put together in Microsoft Paint ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> in full color print. And people started making all like stickers and notes and selling them on Redbubble and all of this stuff. Then some people started dressing up as us for Halloween. That was a strange Halloween. I like the cat though, that's pretty cool. Then some people got on an actual boat with logos like you can't arrest an idea and the anonymous flag. Um, we were very briefly, according to Google Trends, more popular than the boy band One Direction for about one day. In many ways, that was what it was all about, just beating them. <laughs> and then uh, we were all arrested. <laughs> Not One Direction, unfortunately. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Zane. <laughs> so I was arrested in the Shetlands and flown to London on a private police of Learjet because it was the only way to get my, me off the island, held for four days. And they said, that I'm a threat to national security and you know, it shouldn't be released if you're a threat to the public, etc. And I was just like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> You know, whatever. So the, the judge, the judge looked at me and just went, "No, he's blatantly some kid from the middle of nowhere. Just, just let him go, ban him from the internet, and put him on an electronic tag." So I spent the next two years banned from the internet, which is super annoying, uh, with a, a home curfew of 10 p.m., which, in combination with being banned from the internet, is especially annoying, given I'd moved from the middle of nowhere to a big city like London where finding your way around is hard without Google Maps, and then finding your way around without Google Maps and legally having to be home by 10 p.m. unless a van, uh, a van comes to your house and arrests you. So I, I was running about quite a bit. I think I sprained my ankle running up the Angel Escalator at 9.59 p.m. in order to get back. So I, was, I ended up standing trial in Southwark Crown Court here in London. I was sentenced to two years in prison, although because of the time I spent on electronic tag, etc., that was one year of probation and mathematically only seven or eight weeks in prison. And so I went to Feltham Young Offenders, which was apparently the most violent prison in the UK. It's a very strange place to send a hacker. But I'm told, I'm told the, the way the prison system works is you go to the prison that's closest to the court so that the van doesn't have to drive as far. So that's why I was there. And, and when I went in, I was, I was, I was scared. But I think, I think the hacking thing worked OK in there. I think everyone's got this natural icebreaker in prison where you've gone against the system in some way and hacking sort of goes against the system in this very definable way. And so people would come up to me and say, yeah, I've smuggled a Blackberry and can you hack it for me or can you do my maths exam and all of this. <laughs> one, one mildly scary incident, um, a, a new inmate came in and when people come in they seem to have this idea that they need to start a fight to prove themselves, which is the worst thing you can do in prison. So this guy comes in and he sees me and goes, I'm going to pick on that guy. So he comes up to me and he's like, oh, you wanna, do you want to start something, etc." And I'm just, I'm naturally kind of sarcastic. And I'm like, I don't know, there's not much to start around here. We're not going to, I don't know, we're not going to be able to start it. And this guy that I shared a cell with, his name is Mr. T. It's all he would, all he would call himself. Massive guy. He basically ran the wing. He, he was, he was just, he was enormous. He goes to the gym every day in prison. He just went right up to this guy and went, yo, blood, you do not mess with hacker, innit? You know why? That, he'll remortgage your house, blood. Isn't he? He'll remortgage your house. You won't even know he did it. So you, you don't mess with Hacker. And this guy was like, oh, I'm sorry, Hacker. I, did, I didn't know. <laughs> then all the guards started calling me Hacker, etc. So I, I was released. And I think the thing that sticks with me most about that experience and, 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 and young people going through that, 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 that kind of system was upon release, one of the guards said to me, oh, you'll be back next week because there's a 95% re-offender rate. And I can see why you're, 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 you're left with a bus fare home and that's it, you go, you go to probation. A horrible system um, for everyone. So nowadays, this is five years later, hacking has changed quite a lot. The culture of hacking has changed quite a lot. Back in when I was doing this stuff in 2011, even if you ethically broke into a, a company or a government and then emailed them saying, we found some flaws in your website, um, here's how you fix it, they will prosecute you, they'll come for you. There's, there's no way to ethically do that. Just the other month, this 15-year-old kid hacked into the Dutch government, and he emailed them just saying, I uh, found some flaws, um, I kind of got access to everything. 
And the Dutch government responded, I think the best way possible, they, they said, all right, that's, that's very good. Tell us how to fix that. We're going to acknowledge you on official government websites, media coverage, etc. And they sent him some swag. They sent him a t-shirt that literally said, I hacked the Dutch government and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> That is, I think that is the best possible government response to a website being hacked. Because they could have, you know, it would have been game over for him five years ago. They would have come down on him with like, choppers smashing in his door, ruined his life forever. And I think nowadays so many governments and companies and individuals are getting on board with this. We have these things called bug bounty programs where sites like Facebook, Twitter, and whomever else can basically sign up to a service um, and say, or, you know, we have, we have critical infrastructure, we have valuable systems. If you're a hacker, uh, email us with, with a bug that you found, we'll fix it and we'll pay you. And so Facebook, for example, if you hack Facebook, they'll give you $500 minimum every single time if they accept it as a security risk. And I think this kind of system is fantastic because what you get, what you have to look at is hacker motivations. Why, why do they do what they do? A lot of it is kudos from other hackers and the challenge of doing it. Um, the last thing often on hackers' minds, even the black hat hackers that release you know, customer information to the open web, ironically, the last thing on their mind is releasing customer information to the open web. They're thinking, oh, I've broken into the website. I've, I've got the challenge of doing that. I want to prove myself. What's the easiest thing to do? The easiest thing to do 10, 15 years ago was just to cause havoc, cause mayhem. Nowadays, you tell the company, even if you've, in fact, the more mayhem you cause, the better, because the more you can prove to their security team what a threat it is, and you can get paid for it. You can get put on a leaderboard of, with other hackers. You get a point system where you get like 50 points for hacking Twitter, 75 points for hacking Facebook. And I, I, don't, I don't do this stuff very often anymore, but I've got bug bounties in with Apple, Facebook, Google. They're all great. You email them, and Apple, the other month, got back within a day just saying, okay, we've acknowledged you in the next iOS update. So I think there's this, there's this gap that's being bridged, which is fantastic, and I think that's definitely the way forward. And to illustrate that, I'd like to talk a little bit about this guy. His name is Aaron Barr, and he was one of the targets of, of our hacking in 2011. He owned a cybersecurity company, and he said to the Financial Times that he had discovered the leaders of Anonymous. It's a very, very funny statement, and we thought, okay, we'll, we'll go hack him and have a look at who he thinks the leaders of Anonymous are. And so we, got, we hacked him, got uh, his entire company, got this document that was all just nonsense. So we just published the document ourselves instead of letting him publish it and give it to the FBI. And in the, in the meantime, we saw his email inbox, 50,000 company emails. The reason that we managed to get into that was because he used the same password for his World of Warcraft account and his uh, company's entire email account. <laughs> It's not great. It also wasn't a very strong password. I won't recite it letter by letter. But it was mostly just letters. Um, and we found out through, through their emails that they were the kind of developing kind of sketchy malware and uh, you know, trying to discredit journalists like Glenn Greenwald, who were in support of WikiLeaks at the time. And they almost had a congressional hearing into the company. He claimed there was 10 million in damages. The company dissolved. He got fired and then from his next job, etc. And so, and, and then, I, then I went to trial, for including this. And so in many ways, both of our lives were kind of melted down and reformed and shattered in many different ways, and emotionally and, and, and otherwise, because of this stuff. And we both made, I probably made slightly more mistakes than he did. But we, I, I messaged him on Twitter just last year, saying, this, this is weird. This is, I mean, I, I saw him previously on the Stephen Colbert show, uh, not in person, but just this picture of him. And Colbert was just looking at him, mocking him. He was kind of the face of bad security, uh, alleged to have entered the hornet's nest of Anonymous and gotten stung. So I messaged him on Twitter just saying, this, is, this, is, this has been a strange time. Let's meet up. And it was a while. And we did. We, we met in a, in a pub in London. And I just did the only thing I knew how to do, which was buy him a whiskey. And I got him another whiskey. And we started playing Pokemon Go. It had just come out at the time, and he, he has much better Pokemon than I do. And so I think, I think he wins in that regard. It was a strange chat. We started chatting about security, and you know, it, was, it was weird to see someone in real life that I'd only have these kind of vague notions of online. My only perception of him was these kind of online chats and these emails, and we'd be kind of at war together, but at war in the same way that kind of anything is a war through the internet, whether we had Twitter, Flame War, and taking down the CIA side. It was very hard to combine the two images in my head. And so we just ended up getting really drunk. And we were talking about Edward Snowden. I massively agree with Edward Snowden. He doesn't, so that was a good debate. A conversation caught the attention of someone at the bar who just came up to us and said, look, sorry to ask, but how do you guys even know each other? And Aaron said the best thing. He just looked down at his whiskey and just shook it around and said, well, we met online and just took a long, a long... That's not actually what he sounds like. I don't know why I gave him that voice just now. 
Aaron Barr, cybersecurity expert. No. Um, so I ended up falling asleep just in his hotel room. I needed a place to crash. And when I woke up in the morning, he was gone. He'd, he'd flown, he was vanished. All his stuff was gone. He'd flown to America to consult or, or go to a conference. I just was woken up by, the, by the, the room service coming in. Very strange experience. I was first, the first thing that went through my head was, I read this guy's email six years ago. I know he's an expert on bugging software. And, and, and planting bugs in people. So then I was in the shower that day just checking, making sure he, has, he wasn't formulating some like six year long revenge. Um, but it, it turned out he wasn't. We continued playing Pokemon Go. We continued to chat. I think really excellent guy. And what, what I, what I, think, I think what I'm trying to say about that is, this is someone that was on the, uh, the other end, the target of Anonymous, the target of Lulsec, someone that we'd, just, we'd seen this image of and thought, that is the face of the corporation, sort of greedy cybersecurity corporation that we were against. And there's so many similarities between us creatively. And I think hackers, security experts, yeah, musicians, theatre goers, creatives, all have this same kind of feeling of, of, of wanting to, to deconstruct something, put it back together, understand it, understand the ins and outs of it. And that's why my best collaborations have come from those people. And so I think we shouldn't be afraid to engage hackers. I think we should look through the hyperbole of, 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 of the media, the word cyber attack, which is applied to literally everything from a country's website going down to that someone DDoSes their friend's Minecraft server and that's considered a cyber attack. It's all put into this one thing and it's, it's horrible, it doesn't make any sense and it vilifies it, it adds a stigma to it. So I think we shouldn't be afraid to engage hackers. If you work for a company, just hire them, make a bug bounty program, go to these hacker conferences. They're absolutely amazing. I think hackers can be a force for good in the future, and we definitely need them. So, thank you. <laughs> Hack the planet. <laughs>